Welcome to Fear Free Childbirth Podcast with Alexia Leachman, the weekly nine-month podcast to help parents-to-be look forward to their fear-free childbirth. Alexia is a pregnancy and head trash clearance coach and the author of Fear Free Childbirth, How to Have a Stress-Free Pregnancy and a Positive Pain-Free Birth. As a mum who's had two fear-free and pain-free births, Alexia wants to share with you how she overcame her pregnancy and childbirth fears so that you can look forward to having a fear-free birth too. Over the nine-month life of this podcast, Alexia will be sharing some real-life stories from mums and dads, insights into the latest childbirth research, inspiring tales from birth professionals, and some tips and techniques for clearing your fears and stresses. If you would like to receive a free chapter from her book, then head over to fearfreechildbirth.com, where you can also sign up for her email series, How to Have a Stress-Free Pregnancy. But now, it's time for the show. Hello and welcome back to the Fear Free Childbirth podcast. This is me, your host, Alexia Leachman. Thank you so much for joining me today. Now, on today's show, I've got a real, real treat for you. I'm interviewing a best-selling author. Uh, Today, I've got guest Sophie Fletcher on the show, and Sophie is the author of Mindful Hypnobirthing, but she is also one of the founders of Mindful Mama, which is a fantastic organisation for women to attend courses to help them prepare for a calm and confident birth. Now, the interesting thing about the interview that I had with Sophie is that I recorded this while I was seven months pregnant. And I initially recorded this for my Head Trash Show podcast because I've been dying to get her on the show for ages. But we were just, you know, busy, couldn't get diaries fixed and all that. And life was getting in the way and all that kind of stuff. So finally, when I was pregnant, uh, we managed to get a date in the diary. So this was recorded ages ago now and then since then I decided I ended up writing up my own book on childbirth and I've launched the child this fear-free childbirth podcast and I thought you know what this interview would be much better suited to this podcast so this is why I'm putting it out here on the fear-free childbirth podcast and to be honest it's an absolutely brilliant interview I was listening to it again just as you know, to hear what we were saying. And it's just so interesting. There's so many things that as somebody who's expecting a baby that is just going to be so useful for you to hear, to try and quell all those fears that you might have. Sophie is incredibly knowledgeable about childbirth. She's a doula as well, and has been running Mindful Mama courses for many, many years. And she's also a clinical hypnotherapist. So she really does know her stuff when it comes to managing and clearing fears around childbirth and preparing women for having a positive childbirth experience. So some of the stuff that we chat about during the the interview, oh my goodness, there's just so much. We talk about the fear, tension, pain cycle. We talk about how you can really prepare your mind for childbirth, but also what's happening to your body. So in one of my other podcasts, I shared with you, you know, one of the main sources of fear that you have as a woman coming into childbirth is actually based on not knowing what on earth is going on. So she touches on some of that physiological stuff that happens to your body. And just hearing some of that stuff can really be you know, can really just dis- dissolve your fears instantly because you, you immediately know that your body is made for this and there really isn't a need to worry. So I'm not going to sort of go on too much about that now, but all I can say is listen to this podcast interview. It's absolutely fascinating. And Sophie is an absolute gem. So over to the time that I chatted to Sophie Fletcher from Mindful Mama and the author of Mindful Hypnobirthing. So today on today's show, I'm absolutely thrilled to have with me Sophie Fletcher. And Sophie Fletcher is the author of Mindful Hypnobirthing and also the founder of Mindful Mama, which is an organisation that helps women to to have natural pain-free births. And she has therapists around the country that run classes to help women to have natural pain-free births. So welcome to the show, Sophie. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hello. So uh, I now we first met a few years ago, didn't we? Because I came on your course when I was pregnant with my first to discover the uh, the magic of hypnobirthing and mindful mama and the approach to having um, being able to have a birth that was natural and pain free. Because when I first got pregnant I was absolutely terrified and I thought I was going to go for every single drug under the sun and it's going to be a horrible painful experience and somebody shone the light and 
made me aware that it is possible to have a natural pain-free birth and so began my journey on discovering the things like hypnobirthing, natural birthing, water births and all that kind of stuff and that's how we met when I came on your course and your course was incredible. Really, really enjoyed it. So thank you so much for joining me today. It's really, really brilliant. So um, pleased to be here. (laughs) Now, um, I've just sort of used quite a lot of terms there that some people might not know what they are. So things like mindful uh, birthing, hypnobirthing, water birthing. Do you you mind just sort of telling us a little bit about what some of those things are for people that maybe haven't heard of those terms before? Well, I think hypnosis and mindfulness are certainly ways of um, very specifically looking at the mind-body connection during labour and and thinking about how you think can affect your body during the birth, mm. um, either in a in a bad way or in a good way. Things like water birth, active birth, those different approaches to birth are all ways of managing the birth physiologically that can um, be complementary to a good mindset and working with um, a mind approach. Mm. So all of them are really about um, allowing birth to do what it does naturally, allowing your body to do what it does naturally. And um, it's very different from medicalization of birth so what what brought you into working in this way or what what kind of what's your story that brings you to working you know as a as a hypnotherapist and working in the mind body connection and specifically around birth well i i i in fact i worked in something completely different i was a policy advisor um for regional government when i had my first son mm. and i was totally green i was the eldest of 13 girls in my family to have a baby I was the eldest of all my friends at university to have a baby so my close group of friends I was I had no one else to learn from Mm. and so I read what to expect when you're expecting all those classic books and um and I remember my mum saying to me oh you you must join the NCT and that was, I didn't have a clue what the NCT was even. And I remember telling my midwife about it. And she said, oh, gosh, you don't want to join that. That's a Green Welly Brigade. And so I was totally put off like that. I lived in the city centre. I was definitely not the Green Welly Brigade at all. And I thought, oh, that's probably not me. And I just dismissed even the NCT right. straight away. So I did my NHS antenatal class, which was all about um I saw some forceps and I saw an epidural needle and that's how I thought it would be and I ended up with a breech baby preeclampsia and a cesarean section on Christmas day so I suppose it was it was a total antithesis of what I thought it would be I I really thought that it's the sort of thing I could get on and do I had it in my head yeah I can get on I can do that I wasn't frightened I, would, I don't think I was frightened of birth, certainly not consciously, mm, but I okay. certainly didn't prepare very mindfully for my birth. Okay. Um, I, I, I worked until the very last minute. Um, and then with my second, um, I suppose I just wanted things to be a bit different. Mm. And my mum rang me up and said, Sophie, Sophie, they're talking about pain-free birth on um, Richard and Judy, switch it on. And I was about 15 weeks pregnant and I switched it on and I was like, yeah, whatever. And um, but I was interested, and so I got some CDs, and I listened to them every single night throughout my pregnancy, um, because I loved listening to them. It helped me sleep. I felt really calm, um, and again, I wasn't frightened at all of the birth. Um, and and for some reason, I felt very connected with this pregnancy much more than my first. And I knew he was coming early, and. So when he did, it wasn't a huge surprise, around 32 weeks. Wow. Um, but it was a high-risk situation. I was 17 months after my first birth. Um, it was a VBAC. Um, I had a 32-weeker with meconium in my waters, which is which can be a sign that there is a problem. And so I was really closely monitored in the hospital. Um, and they said to me, right, we're going to have to give you a cesarean because of the meconium. And I weighed up my options I hadn't been in a class because I couldn't get on one then. Um, I weighed up all my options and I knew I didn't want a cesarean. I wanted to have go for um, a normal birth, vaginal birth as far as I possibly could. So I was induced and and I did go on to have um, a vaginal birth. Um, it wasn't pain-free, I have to be honest and say that. And I think a lot of it is about perception. 
but I was induced and um, I remember the midwives coming in and kind of looking at the machine and looking at me because at points throughout it while I was listening to my CD I was just looked like I was sleeping mm. and they couldn't believe it um, but it just was totally it was totally manageable mm. and um, and the best thing of it all, even though we was born at 32, 33 weeks, we were at home breastfeeding within six days, yeah. which they said they'd never never happened before. And I'm sure it was because I was in a really good state of mind and that, that had a knock-on effect. And um, and so I'm a strong believer in, in the mind and body connection, not just for pain-free birth, but also I think it helps you have your best possible birth. I think it gets you, if you're in the right frame of mind, and you're thinking about things um, carefully, you're not in that highly emotional, irrational state. I think it can help you to make decisions that are right for you and to be able to reflect on those decisions and know why you made them. Mm. But also stay being, being in a good state of mind and staying calm, being able to manage your breathing and things like that definitely benefits the baby mm. and I'm sure it, it benefited my son and so that really just made me very aware of this whole area that I'd never really thought about and I was just so interested in it. So did that kick off your journey into becoming a hypnotherapist or becoming a doula was that the beginning of the journey for you? Yeah I guess it was I suppose I was, I was very interested and it was my husband who encouraged me and said why don't you go and find out a bit more about it? So it was more like a personal development course to start off with. Mm. It was something that I was just intrigued about. And when I did my hypnotherapy course, I was just blown away about the application of hypnotherapy. It was incredible. Mm. Um, and then that was, at, I think it was at that point that I knew this was something I actually wanted to do as a living. Mm. Mm. Um, I thought it can't remain undiscovered and it can't remain you know, people have to be able to access this and yeah. know about it. So is that what inspired founding Mindful Mama? Yeah, I mean, I think we, as women, we have, in a way, we have a duty to inform other women of these opportunities and actually what the reality is. Mm. And, I, and I felt really passionate about that. And I suppose I wanted to go out there and just shout from the rooftops, it doesn't have to be like that because it's really like this. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, and I just, it's such, you know, it's just so wonderful. Every time I get a birth story, every time someone like you comes back, <laughs> tells you, it, you know, it's just amazing just to have made a difference to one woman. Yeah. No, so I've certainly my own experience when I first fell pregnant the first time round. I was, I was like, give me all the drugs in the world. I'm going to have yeah. all of it. I don't want for me it's like I didn't want this painful horrible experience that I thought was the only way it was going to be and when somebody mentioned to me on a course once they said well oh I had a pain-free birth you know and I was like you what like you put in my leg like that doesn't exist you know I really as far as my own awareness and what I'd been told that, that I didn't realize you could have a pain-free birth you know so when I've been told oh you know you want to check out hypnobirthing it was like I am going to do that and especially when I was what I also learned at the same time is like if you have a baby that is born naturally in a pain-free birth and, and without drugs, then you're more likely to have a baby that sleeps through the night, that breastfeeds easily, that's calm. And I was like, now hang on a minute, this this is worth yeah. trying because, you know, all the nightmares about babies crying and you're not getting any sleep for 12 months and more. You know, suddenly I thought this is a good motivating factor here for me to, to, to have do what I can to bring about a calm baby that's going to not cause an absolute nightmare life when you're a young mum that so many people whinge about and so that for me was the beginning of that journey and what I learned and now I totally agree with you but you do want to shout it from the rooftops I still come across so many women today that believe that you have to give birth in hospital that you have to have yeah. the drugs that you that that's the only way they see one born every minute they think that's the way it is and it's like yeah. it doesn't have to be that way there is there's another way and I feel like it's sound like a Nat West advert <laughs> <laughs> but there is another way so uh yeah so I totally totally um and I think it's brilliant that you set up something like Mindful Mama to help spread the word yeah and, and so what do you offer through Mindful Mama then to help you know shout it from the rooftops as you were saying well it was really interesting because when Mia and I originally um trained we trained in the Mongan method 
um, which is a 12 and a half hour course. And Marie Mungan um, really, I mean, there are a lot of hypnotherapists practicing hypnosis for birth and that sort of thing. Um, but I suppose Marie Mungan was the first person to put it together as a proper birth program. Mm. Um, and it's a great program. Um, I think what she's done is brilliant. But what we found is that women were quite sceptical and they wanted to dip their toe in it rather than embarking on a really long course. And and also the partners themselves, they, I mean, when we used to say, oh, I'm really interested, but I'm going to have to check with my husband. And then they'd never call us back. <laughs> and so um, whilst we loved teaching the Monga method, um, we wanted, I suppose we wanted to work with more mainstream women, women who possibly wouldn't have done something like this unless they'd be able to try it a bit and mm. and so we wanted to do a shorter course something where you could come in you could do the techniques it would be like a springboard because it really is all about taking ownership of the process once you've done a class anyway mm. um and so and we wanted to base something on much more contemporary research around psychology and neuroscience and and that sort of thing um, and there is so much research coming out now around that and around perceptions around pain and how we receive messages around pain that mm. um, it's starting to really um, really mirror what we've been teaching as well. Mm. Mm. Um, and so really it's 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 a it's a quick course. It's really attractive to the mums and their partners because it's a one day course, and I think, that's what we we really wanted to do is try and reach those women who perhaps wouldn't have tried it otherwise. So you mentioned the P word pain. So let's just dive in and talk about pain for a minute. We've oh talked yeah, about pain free births. We talk about natural births, and some people might be listening to this going, "Hang on a minute, how is that even possible? What are you on about? There's yeah. got to be some mind Jedi tricks going on here." So just I think it'd be you know just tell us a little bit more about the idea of how is it possible to experience a pain free birth. Well, the, the the first thing is I don't I, I don't sell it as pain free birth mm. because um, a lot of women do experience pain free birth, but I also worry that some I've always had the worry that some people who do the course if they think that it's going to give them a pain free birth, um, if suddenly they do feel what they would call pain during the birth that they think they failed. Yeah. And that's not the case. Different. There are all sorts of different things that can happen physiologically that contribute to the much bigger picture. Mm. And for me, hypno- hypnosis for birth and hypnobirthing is more about um, a woman being in, in more control of the process, taking ownership of the process, her partner being able to support her because he's in the right space emotionally. Um, and, and so it's more about having your best possible birth and having a very positive experience. Mm. However, I think people do underestimate the power of hypnosis and what it can actually do. And I try and tell t- people this, and they, and pe- I don't think people really believe that you can, for example, um, have surgery under hypnosis. Mm. Um, there's an article I quote quite a lot by someone called John Butler, who wrote something for The Guardian a few years ago. You can Google it. Um, I was awake when having surgery. Mm. Um, And he talks about putting... He's a hypnotherapist, and he used self-hypnosis for a hernia operation, and he describes what he did and how it was. And so I think um, there are two aspects of hypnosis for birth. There is understanding your physiology and letting go of any fear that can create tension and pain in your body. Mm. Equally, it's really believing that hypnosis is an enormously powerful anesthesia. Mm. And, I mean, I use it all the time for things. And um, and so, yes, I do have lots of women who say they they would say that it was very intense and very powerful, um, but they would describe it as pain-free. But another woman having the same birth might say, no, it was really painful. It's a lot of it comes down to perception mm. of sensations. Mm. That's that's how how I see it. Yeah, personally, I would have described my own birth, the, well, not my birth, my first labour as being intense mm. and powerful. But I wouldn't use the word pain. To yeah, describe it. Um, it was just full on intense. But yeah, pain's not part of my vocabulary when I describe it. So that's definitely something that I resonate with when I hear you say that. Yeah, and I think um, understanding, I think the connection between that sensation, I think 
the problem is women are taught to expect pain Mm. and there's some really good research out now to show that if you expect pain you're likely to experience worse pain and the expectation of pain is actually more powerful than opioid drugs so even if you have an opioid drug like something like remifentanil if you are if you are expecting pain you will experience that pain over the drug wow so i find that really incredible yeah um and so for me it's a lot about teaching women that the you um when you go into into labor you will experience sensations you've never experienced before mm. They are intense and unique and powerful, but at the same time, because you've been taught that that's pain, your brain does a quick calculation and says, right, intense, strong, powerful sensation I've never had before. People have told me it's pain, so it must be pain. So your brain labels that sensation as pain because that's what you've been told to expect. And... I think that's quite hard to get your head around actually it's take it took me a long time to get my head around and it's like if I hurt myself or burn myself or if I've got cramps or anything like that I use hypnosis and I change the sensation Mm. get into a tingling or a pressure or whatever Mm. we have the power in our minds to alter how we receive those messages from our body and how we experience those sensations based on our own beliefs, not on those of others. And I guess it's, you know, just taking it to a very different scenario where you might be going on a, let's say, a, a roller coaster ride at a fairground and you might be standing at the top just before the fairground goes, you know, the ride kicks off and you could yeah. be sitting there like either really excited, either really terrified, but you've got the fluttering in your tummy. Yeah. And whether you choose to describe that as utterly terrifying or really exciting. Yeah. It's the same physical sensation. It's the label that you're applying to it. And so exactly. if you just choose to label it differently, you will change your whole experience. Yeah. And so it, it's it's taking that kind of learning and, and making sure that you're... But I guess it, it takes a bit of mindfulness to be able to step back and choose how you label an experience. Yeah. So that what then follows is then more in line with something that's going to give you something more positive than being sucked into the negative version yeah. of that possible experience. But, yeah. So it's applying that kind of thinking, isn't it, is what you're saying? Yeah, and I think the one thing I expect when I work with someone is that they're open to changing their beliefs. Mm. And I think that's at the core of everything. If someone is willing to change their belief around birth and they understand why they are doing it and they have the motivation to make that change, they can just change so much about their experience mm. of pregnancy and birth. And when we were um, talking earlier, we were talking about these different filters and how we Mm. receive information. And our brain is always looking for patterns to reinforce our existing beliefs. Um, And I said to you, it's a bit like social media streams. So when when you're subscribed to something like Facebook, you subscribe to certain groups or pages and things which are consistent with your beliefs. Mm. So, for example, I I subscribe to things like birth without fear one born every minute the truth which is really what it is um and our numerous other pages um where they regularly post information that's consistent with with my belief um however if i were birthing for the first time and i didn't know anything about this whatsoever i might subscribe to a much more mainstream a much more um i'd I'm not going to say any names, <laughs> but there are a lot of forums and a lot of um, organizations out there that people subscribe to who list things that can trigger thoughts around things that can go wrong and and draw attention to things. And um, it's much more focused on the medicalization of birth. Mm. And so if you're subscribed to that, you start seeing things and thinking, oh, Oh, they've got that. Oh, I've I've got that symptom a bit. Oh, oh, and then your focus starts going to that, and mm. um, and so I think a bit like um, if you change your streams and change where you're getting that information, you see different things. Your focus shifts. Your belief changes, mm. and so I encourage women all the time to look at the information they're receiving and looking at if they want to be calm and in control and focused and to feel good about the birth 
what information do they need to be receiving to have that belief mm. and to alter the information that they're receiving mm. and and so but it takes motivation and yeah. you need to want to do it to make that change it doesn't happen without input mm. and i think one of the challenges as well is that it's other women because other women are very they're more than happy to share birth nightmares horror stories you know almost like these yeah. stories that pass through the family and you know some yeah. women might grow up knowing that they caused their mother excruciating pain and and so there's almost these stories that are willing to be they're shared more than willingly and yet those positive birth experiences aren't always shared as willingly because maybe it's felt that it's they had a fluke or it wasn't normal or or they they don't want to be maybe rubbing other people's noses in it that they had such a great birth or positive experience and so yeah. even among friends you just find out there's there's a lot of sort of stuff to support any negative experiences and any negative beliefs there's, there's more than enough chatter to support all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. as well which must make it very hard to kind of eliminate that from your environment I would imagine for some yeah I think part of the problem is we're stuck in this cultural cycle of medicalization mm. so the more women that are having those experiences of um inductions at last days and various other stories like that um the more women are hearing that the more frightened they're becoming but the more it's coming into their belief system mm. so i i do think that we're in a i mean michelle odon who's a really well-known obstetrician says we're at the bottom of an abyss because you know we are just so far away from where we should be with birth and I think the the challenge is culturally it's changing so much that women to get out of that cycle I think you have to be really proactive mm. and what I do is I say to women change your, your streams on social media start seeking out information that supports how you want to be mm. um, if someone tells you a story you don't really want to hear um, maybe politely decline or also, we use a thing in hypnosis called reframing. So if someone tells you something, a story, it's how would I do it differently? What have I learned from this? Mm. So in some ways, you can use them, those stories positively. Mm. But I think the saddest thing is about those stories and, and the differences between them is some women, yes, they don't like to go into their class afterwards when they hear everyone else has had a traumatic experience and say, mine was really easy. Mm. But also, I think women who've had really easy births just don't t don't think to talk about it because it was just like it just happened. Yeah, it was fine. I don't know what else to talk about. Yeah, no big deal. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah. And I think there's also the problem that women who are having traumatic experiences, who are feeling disempowered, and who have been left having um, really quite upsetting experiences. Mm there's no one to talk for them to talk to afterwards mm. and if you've had any sort of upsetting experience you want people to empathize with you to talk to you to help you mm. and so of course someone who's pregnant you think they can empathize with me they're pregnant they they're gonna yeah. and I think it's a subconscious thing women need to offload who've had those sorts of experiences mm. and there are organizations like birth crisis out there that women don't know that they can go back to their midwife, they can talk to their supervisor of midwives even after the birth mm -hmm. about their experience, they can go over their notes. And so, you know, if it were me, I would say to someone who'd had a traumatic experience, I, I, I'd be, I say, you know, I don't mean to be impolite, but I don't really want to hear this right now. But did you know you could go to your supervisor or your midwife mm -hmm. if you need to mm -hmm. talk it through? Mm -hmm. Um, it's a, it's an individual thing, mm. but yes, you're right. It is very challenging, I think, mm. in today's culture. And do you think, um, in terms of wanting to sort of avoid or have the most possible positive experience that you can have, because even though you might do a lot of preparation to try and bring about a natural birth, there are still things that might happen at the last minute that mean that you might have to be induced or have a cesarean or whatever that goes against maybe what you planned. But mm. how much of do you think there's a lot that a woman can do to plan ahead and to you know to, to facilitate the likelihood of having a positive birth experience like that yeah I mean my own experience illustrates that um and as a doula um people are I mean for, I don't know where I think you attract um certain clients 
Um, but I do a lot of work with high risk women, surprisingly. Okay. And so I do, it's really about keeping um, women who are high risk birth plan, birth as normal as possible. And so I've been in, at births where women have gone on to have completely normal births where I think if they hadn't had a doula or hadn't had that type of planning in place, they wouldn't have. Mm. And so um, I think it gives women the opportunity to have their best possible birth, but also to be able to think in a way that enables them to reflect on it as well and say, well, I made that decision because of X, Y, and Z. Mm. And one of the things we teach is um, asking questions, not just saying, yeah, okay, do that. Oh, right, okay, you, yeah, I agree. Mm. And I always say to people, um, if you have to make a decision that takes you off piece, or takes you off your plan you have to um have 10 minutes to think about it so unless it's an absolute emergency in that second you'll more than likely have time yeah. and yeah. so ask everyone to leave the room sit with you and your partner and just make a list of why you're making that decision is there anything else do you think you can do in that moment and if you need to write it down because one of the best ways is you know, if you look back, and even if it's gone off course, you you can look back and have it written down and say, I made this decision because of X, Y, and Z. And you, because you've made that decision, you're taking ownership of it. And it feels, um, after the birth, it feels like you've been, mu- you, you know, you've been much more in control. Mm. Um, and sometimes that means you might make the, the decision that you, has been presented to you. Or it might be that you say, well, actually, we could ask them X, Y, and Z. And it might be that you just get another half an hour and that other half an hour makes all the difference. Mm. Mm. And so having 10 minutes of quiet to make a choice is really important. Every time you're, you're taking a choice, it takes you off, off, off your birth plan. Mm. And I think if you do that, it changes how you feel after the birth. Women that I speak to that feel most upset about their birds and feel as if it's they've really lost control haven't done anything like that or thought they'd been able to do that right okay the strength of the moment to kind of push back a bit and ask for a bit of time to make those decisions with your partner yeah i think so and really so the, and it's really important that the partner when we're talking about mindfulness that the partner is is more mindful of the mum's needs and the mum's space um, and not his own feelings and emotions at that point, which are important, of course. Mm. But it's about giving the mother that sense of, I've made this mm. choice. I needed to do X, Y, and Z. Mm. Um, and sometimes a partner's own fear and anxiety can get in a way of, of, of a mum's, mm. what the mum really wants. Yeah. And I've seen that happen in the past. So you've talked about fear quite a bit and earlier on we you touched on the fear, tension, pain cycle. So would you, would you mind if we just talk a little bit more about that? Because that's certainly an area that when I read about the fear, tension, pain cycle, was it kind of explains so much in my mind as to why it's important to think about what your fears are and try and work on them ahead. It'd be really great to hear your perspective on the fear, tension, pain cycle and, and it's the role that fear can play within childbirth. Yeah, and how maybe we can kind of use that information to try and help us have a more positive birth experience. Yeah, I mean, the fear, tension, pain cycle is um, probably not is going on a hundred years old now. Actually, is it? <laughs> I can't remember. Grantly Dick Reed talked about it, mm. and um, in his book Childbirth Without Fear, and it's used by NCT, by, by the hypnobirthing practitioners everywhere, loads of other yoga practitioners. Mm. Everyone's very aware of how fear can create tension in, in the body. Mm. And um, when we are very afraid at an, an unconscious level or even a conscious level, we release um, adrenaline, the fight or flight hormone. So that's the hormone that we release when we feel anxious, frightened. So when you talked about as well, the butterflies yeah. standing at the bottom of that roller coaster, yeah. that's, a, that's a kind of adrenaline response. Yeah. And um, an adrenaline creates tension in our body and um, blood rushes to our arms and our legs so we can fight or we can run away. Sometimes we freeze. I know I freeze when there's wasp nearby. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but importantly, this fear 
creates tension and it's a bit like um we we forget we're mammals really mm. and we are animals like many other animals that give birth that um and we if we were out in the wild and there was a predator and we weren't safe to birth we the adrenaline would give us the energy to run away to find a safe place but also it would slow the birth down because as mammals we are not going to birth our babies where we feel threatened or where we feel dangerous no. and the problem with tension is that it creates pain in our bodies because the muscles in our uterus start to work um they don't work as harmoniously harmoniously as they do mm. when we feel comfortable when we feel safe when we feel um private or unobserved mm. And the thing is, when we start to feel pain in our bodies, the more pain we feel, the more anxious and more frightened we become because pain is an indicator from our body that something is wrong. Mm. And when we're giving birth, you know, the last thing we want is for something to go wrong. And so I think that, from, from my view, that heightens the fear even more. It's exacerbated by the situation we're in. Mm. And so that creates more tension, more pain. And so women get stuck. You can see them on one born every minute. Not that I'm encouraging people to go <laughs> watch it. Um, you can see how women get stuck in this cycle of fear, tension, pain. It's like a spiral. Mm. And um, midwives often say it's actually... I talk about the birthing zone in my book, which is where women are when they're not in that cycle. And when they're out, when they start to move outside of that zone, that's the adrenaline coming in. And midwives say when a woman gets out of that zone, it's actually very hard to get her back into it mm. because she feels frightened. Mm. And um, I mean, one, one thing we often ask when training midwives, Mia, my colleague and I, is how many women do you get coming in saying that um, something's not quite right, they're not feeling right, they, they, they think it's the curry they had last night to get labour started, you know, and could they just check them over? And they check them over and they say, five to six centimetres dilated. And then suddenly it's like a light switch. These women are demanding epidurals, they're in so much pain. In, in a few seconds, they wow. switch from thinking they've had a bit of a dodgy curry and got a bit of a tummy ache. <laughs> to being in unmanageable pain. And I absolutely believe they are in that moment because A, they're expecting pain around birth. B, they're frightened of the pain. So that increases the tension and the anxiety. And so that's where women get into that spiral. So if you can see that for what it is mm. and look at other mammals and how other mammals birth in the dark, in the quiet, where they feel very safe, really unobserved, if they feel very comfortable, then hopefully people can start to understand what, what that actually means to birth. Mm. But it's also the unconscious fear. You can work with um, the, the conscious fear, but what's going on underneath the surface is where hypnosis comes in and where, where we really, really work with changing women's deep, deep unconscious beliefs around birth. So would you work on fears like that um, before in the lead up to the birth then? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, for me, the preparation for birth is all about clearing out that little part of your brain that holds all that negative information about birth that might mm. trigger an instinctive fight or flight fear response. Mm. And hypnosis is brilliant at doing that. It's quick, it's easy, it's non-invasive. And non-invasive is also a really comfortable, mm. really enjoyable therapy. Mm. Um and so hypnosis is all about the prepar preparation for me. And I think during the birth, it's much more about mindfulness, mm. about staying in that zone and getting into a good rhythm with your breathing. Mm. Because if you've prepared enough and you've changed your belief and you 100% believe that your body is designed to do it, that you can do it, then when you go into the birth, you are very relaxed, very calm, and your body releases all the right hormones and adrenaline should be kept at bay mm -hmm. so all you need to do is be mindful and be in the present mm -hmm. with that and just keep with each contraction as it comes yeah i know during my first pregnancy i spent the, the, the two months before birth just clearing all my own fears around everything yeah. so that when i finally broke my waters on the day i was 
genuinely excited beyond belief that I was finally going to meet this little thing. And there was not yeah. an ounce of fear. I, I didn't, couldn't trace anything. And the only time during my labour that fear came up was when the midwife said to me, if, if the, the head, you know, the, we've just got to get the head out, the final stage of, of labour. And I, yeah. I, I realised that in that moment, in between contractions, I was just fearful of the pain of the ring of fire, that head bit popping out. And I realised that that was what was holding me back. And I just, in between contractions, cleared that fear of the pain of the head bit popping through yeah. without wanting to be too graphic for the listeners that maybe haven't been through this experience. But um, yeah, and then the next contraction, that's it. Baby came out. And, and once the fear had gone, I, my body was able to just release and let, let the baby come out. And so... Mm. You know, for me, I know that the preparation yeah. I did before birth was crucial to help yeah. me to have the most positive experience, which when I look back at my own birth, was not my own birth, my, my first labour experience was very positive and I'm looking forward to the next, you know, which is yeah. imminent. <laughs> and I think it's wonderful that that you can look forward to your birth. I mean, so many women don't. They're, mm. they're frightened of it. And you think, actually... This is amazing. Yeah. You're going to meet your baby for the first time. It's your baby's first birthday and yeah. your baby's coming into the world. And it's just an amazing, incredible thing. You've built this little person yes. inside you. Your body's just got on and done it. And you haven't had to think about it during pregnancy. You know, you've, your belly's expanded, your internal organs have moved about and you've, your body's got on and done it. Mm. And so the day your baby's born, it's this wonderful transition. And it's about being able to um, embrace that and look forward to it and feel mm. excited about it. I mean, what a wonderful gift. And um, I think being able to prepare for that in a really positive way is just, you know, a lovely, lovely thing. Absolutely. When you think of what the body has created over the, that period and how it's transformed and how... You've had no say. Nature just gets on and does it and does it yeah. beautifully and amazingly. But why would nature let you down at the, the bit where it's going to come out? It's not going to let you down. And to just yeah. carry on, no, just having that knowing that it will be, nature knows what it's doing. Just let it, let it do what it does best. You know, that's what we were yeah. able to do. And I think we were talking earlier about how women don't really understand their physiology of birth. And if they really understood what happened to their body physiologically mm. and what happened to their baby's body physiologically during labor they would just not I think it would just blow all the fears out of the water um I think so much happens that we don't know we're not so taught. share a bit of that share a bit of that now if you can give a little <laughs> bit of an insight as to what is going on so that if anybody's listening go well I it scares the but she was out of me the whole birth thing what what is it that's happening you know coming from somebody like you that that is you know that's so well informed on these things how would you describe it to somebody that doesn't know well I think the first thing is your baby's preparing to be born for days weeks even before they're born mm. their head's nice and low molding into the pelvis and the baby's head the, the bones in the baby's head are really really soft I don't think people realise how soft they are. So they are moulding into the shape of their own, own mother's pelvis. And I see babies born with round heads, but I see babies born with really pointy heads. Really? And the extraordinary thing is it, it's disappeared really quickly, um, within a day really, it's right. back. And, that's, and the baby has three plates on their head that actually slide over each other to make the baby's head nice and small so it fits through the mother's own pelvis and and also when we go and when we start to go into labor we produce all these wonderful hormones um we produce oxytocin which produces um beta endorphins which do these amazing feel-good hormones so you feel kind of sp they're as strong as um they're as sp strong as morphine they can be as strong as morphine mm. you feel totally spaced out on them and they are body's natural painkillers so your body produces all of this when they don't have adrenaline in the way mm. and then um the other one the fear uh, the fear that a lot of women have is around poo yeah um and I don't usually get through a class without a discussion around poop <laughs> during labour. Um, and I always say to them, well, actually, you know, it's a cultural thing that that's an embarrassment. But also, um, it's a really good sign the baby's nearly here. Because if you imagine 
um, the rectum and the vagina next to each other, mm. and as the baby's head comes down, it it it. Ha- it it pushes down on the rectum, so it almost flattens out the rectum, which then just, like a tube of toothpaste as it comes (laughs) down, squeezes anything that's left in there. So actually, if you imagine the head, the baby's head coming down, it's like in that tube of toothpaste, it makes Mm. you realise that that's a really positive sign. Mm. Um, And the other one that I think I really love, because this is another fear, because you hear these awful stories like, oh, it's like, I'm... I, it's it's like pooing a watermelon. <laughs> I heard that a lot when I was pregnant, and I saw it's it's something that goes around a lot. But actually, our vaginas are amazing, and, and it's described as either a fan shape. I think Sheila Kitzinger describes it as a fan shape. I've heard it described as an accordion. And so when we go into labour, if you imagine it like an accordion expanding and opening mm. up, and the ridges in the vagina opening and expanding up and so it's you know and it's amazing all these things go on we shift and change and and we go back to how we were it's really elastic and and so <laughs> I'm, saying, I'm, I'm saying I hope I go back to the way I felt. <laughs> so um but, but all those things they're just some examples of the things we talk about sometimes mm. and I do think that if women understood more about what happens phys- mm. physically during labour, they would think, wow, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. 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 The whole of the process is, I mean, I, I'm pretty much constantly in awe at what's going on in my body as I go through this pregnancy. And, and you know, I just it is just a feeling of awe that it always in, I encounter regularly. And, it, it, yeah. and I think, yeah, if you kind of just, and I try and I consciously stay in that because I think that's a helpful place to be to kind yeah. of all, to, to realize the power of nature and to just throw you know entrust myself to it because that to me is a, a belief or a, a way of looking at it that's going to help me and yeah. I'm going to try so I'm just being stubborn about this rather than you know being distracted by other little things that might sort of take me away from what might be a positive experience and I think but the body truly is an amazing thing and we were born to do this and it is a natural experience and when you hear women saying oh it's not natural to do that I'm gonna have a c-section it's like yes it is you know you don't see animals crying in pain or demanding c-sections it is a very natural thing for us to do and we need to try and get back to that because actually it's it's good for baby and I think it'd be good to maybe just understand a little bit more about what you you know the having a natural birth as much as possible what you know what we we say we're doing all this for you know let's say when we're we're pregnant we we don't drink alcohol we eat the right things we want to do all these things for baby yeah and yet often the actual birth experience if if you were completely focused on baby maybe the best thing for baby isn't going for the c-section or going for the uh, other unless there's safety obviously at play but a natural birth is probably the best thing for baby what are your thoughts on that oh. <laughs> or is that I, very I controversial i have quite a lot of thoughts on this <laughs> um yeah i i've got no doubt that natural birth is best for babe for baby mm. um provided that there's nothing else i mean i've had a cesarean and i've had a, a vaginal delivery mm. and um part of the thing about a vaginal a spontaneous birth is the baby is being born when they're ready to be born um that uh, you know if you induce a baby at 38 weeks who's to say that baby wouldn't have been born until week 41 you were not term until we're 42 mm. so you could be inducing a baby two weeks before they're ready or even three mm. so we i think that's one of the first things is the baby comes when they are ready to come um but i think one of the things that is coming out that is so important about vaginal births are um is something called the microbiome Mm. which is about how our bodies are populated with bacteria during birth. Mm. Um, and so if you think about where the vagina is and how, how much bacteria the baby is populated with when they're born, mm. um, they're looking at the babies that have had C-sections, have high rates of allergies and things like that. Um, there's actually a film called Microbirth, and it's all about this, about the problems with... Um, immune systems and rising rates of cesarean medicalized birth and they've shown that babies for example that were in neonatal units have um, in their guts higher bacteria than um of of the hospital environment mm. rather than 
And, um, I, you know, I've thought about that a lot because I've got one child that has got allergies and one child that doesn't. Mm. And my child that has allergies was a cesarean. Right. My child that, that um, had a vaginal birth doesn't, despite the fact he had antibiotics early on because he was very early. Mm. But I do think that uh, our vaginal births increase um, rates of breastfeeding as well, bonding, that sort of thing. Mm. It's much, I found it, it was harder to get breastfeeding established after a cesarean birth than a vaginal birth as well. Mm. So, of course, there's that benefit. Mm. Um, and also, you've got to remember this baby has been in your womb for nine months in the dark and muffled sounds from around you. And then suddenly, they haven't even, ha you know, in a cesarean where it's been um, been scheduled, they've got no warning that labour's starting or anything, and suddenly they're there. And <laughs> yeah, bright lights. <laughs> it's bright lights. In an unfamiliar environment, they don't recognise smells, um, sounds aloud, and so I think it the sh it can be a big shock to mm. a baby. That transition is is very quick as well. Mm. So um, who's to say what the impact of that is? Mm. We can't we can't measure it very well. No. So it's more an instinctive feeling. But certainly the aspect around um, our bacteria and how. And, it, and more and more children are being diagnosed with um, gut, um, with um, bowel disease and things like that. And whether that there's a correlation with that, it's speculation, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite interesting. Well, I feel like we could talk for hours about this, but I'm conscious of time. Um, there's so much we've talked about in terms of having a natural birth, trying to do what you can to make it the most positive birth experience. And the fear, tension, pain cycle and the role of physiology that plays in birth. Is there anything else that you think would be really useful for women to hear that might be looking for the most positive birth experience for themselves? Well, I think just knowing that you can change your experience, mm. that you can, by, by preparing and start deciding that you want to have a positive experience, taking steps to do that. Mm. Um, not expecting it to come to you, but thinking actually I'm going to go out there and research it you know I want to have a good experience so yeah. think about where you might start if you want to do that and it might be um looking for book lists on Amazon around normal birth and maybe asking some friends who have had good experiences what mm -hmm. they did mm -hmm. um and don't dismiss anything out of hand just be open-minded I think mm -hmm. be open-minded so well, thank you very much, Sophie. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and experiences. And just so that if people want to find out more about you and your work, just sort of tell us a little bit more about where they can find out more about you. Um, you can go to our website, which is mindfulmama.co.uk, mm. or you can read the book. So you can go onto Amazon. It's Mindful Hypnobirthing. Um, and you get MP3s as well with the book mm. as downloads. So you can... If you didn't want to do a course, you could do that. But it's really helpful to go and get practice as well. So, so yeah, you could read the book. You could have a look on the website. Brilliant. You've got yeah. a Facebook page as well, haven't you? We have got a Facebook page. It's Mindful Mama with two Ms or at Mindful Mama on Twitter. Brilliant. Well, I'll so. have all those links in the podcast blog on the Head Trash website. So um, if you guys are interested in finding out more about Sophie's work, then I'll have all those links on the website anyway. So, um, yeah. So thank you once again, Sophie, for joining me today. It's been absolutely fantastic and really interesting. Thank you so Good. much. <laughs> thank you for having me. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Sophie Fletcher. I'm sure you'll agree it was packed with loads of really interesting and useful information, especially if you're currently pregnant and you really want to plan to have a positive birth experience. Now, during that chat, Sophie did share loads of really interesting resources and links and books and all that kind of stuff. So I've made a note of all those and they all links and references for all that will be in the podcast show notes on the fearfreechildbirth.com website. So you just need to go to fearfreechildbirth.com forward slash Sophie for the show notes for today's episode. 
If you have any topics or any questions that come to mind as a result of listening to today's chat, then don't hesitate to email me here on the show at alexia at fearfreechildbirth.com and I will do my best to get back to you and answer any questions. If you've got any ideas on other topics that you'd like me to cover in future episodes or other guests that you'd like to suggest, then again, don't hesitate to let me know. I'd be delighted to hear what you want to hear more about. So until next time, have a great week. Bye for now. Thank you for tuning in. You've just been listening to Alexia Leachman from the Fear Free Childbirth podcast. If you enjoyed the show, she'd really love it if you left a review on iTunes or Stitcher or shared it with a friend. And don't forget, to get a free chapter from her book, head over to fearfreechildbirth.com to get your copy, as well as finding other episodes in this podcast and more about how Alexia can help you with pregnancy and birth preparation coaching. Until next time.